Thank you so much for coming to our University of Atlantia Instructor Spotlight Series this month in honor of food being on many people's minds this week and this month. We are spotlighting our wonderful Mistress Lorelai Greenleaf, who is teaching a class on medieval agriculture. Uh, she's done several classes for university over the um, years, and we are very lucky to have her and um, hope you all will enjoy this wonderful presentation of hers. So with that, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Lorelai. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. And hopefully you can all see that okay. So, yes, medieval agriculture. Um, it's, it's something that has always interested me mundanely as well as in, in the SCA. Um, I've been growing things since I was a small child, had a, a vegetable garden, and I managed a greenhouse, a commercial greenhouse, and later became a master gardener and and have um, quite a bit of gardening space in my property here. I have two acres and kind of a um, edible landscape is what I like to call it. But um, quite a bit of my interest is in how did they do things back in the day? Of course, in the SCA, it's the medieval life. So one thing we know, which actually isn't that different from many farmers today, is that medieval life revolved around the agrarian calendar. Every Everybody's calendar revolved around the agrarian calendar. And for most people, the majority of their time was spent working in, working in the land, working in the fields, trying to grow and raise enough food uh, to survive for another year. Uh, typically, religious feasts mark the sowing and reaping days. Occasionally, you get you could occasionally take a break during those times, a break for the peasants and, and lords alike. Um, let me not forget to. Sorry. Advance my plot. There we go. So yeah, agriculture dictated the very rhythm of daily medieval life. As the Christian religion and the feudal system became entrenched in Europe, the three, <laughs> three different things became pretty interwoven. And I've heard it said that you did one of three things in the Middle Ages. You either prayed, you fought, or you work the land. So praying, of course, the monasteries and all of the activities that had to do with, with monasteries and, of course, fighting and uh, working the land. It's absolutely everything people did to support those other two things, the uh, the church and the army, <laughs> the fighting, um, their lords and whatever silliness they got up to. Okay, and I wanted to point out how ridiculously labor intensive just the simplest things were back in the Middle Ages. And I kind of put this up for, so you can get an idea of, of you know, just wearing the clothes. What did it, what it took to make a garment from linen. And again, everything goes back to the land. It goes back to agriculture and it goes back to forest products. Uh, it, the agriculture was the absolute bedrock of the medi medieval economy. It was the source of all wealth and the source of all power. Being rich didn't mean you had a lot of money. Being rich meant you had a lot of land. And if you had land and controlled that land, then of course you had power. And just this, you know, growing flax for linen, the plowing, the fertilizing, the seeding, the weeding, harvesting, all of that. And all just think about for a moment, all of the people involved in this one process and the tool makers. And then, you know, the, after the, the garment was, was finished and it's just an amazingly intensive process, just this one flax plant that um, 
we need for linen. And of course, linen was one of the primary uh, fabrics used in the Middle Ages. Again, wool, another, another fiber. Um, all of the different processes that are involved, all the different specialties. Not everybody was a specialty in all these different things. Um, just the breeding of the sheep and, and the the um often the renting out of, of the um the rams and you know protecting the flock and shearing the sheep. And you notice in the the lower left picture, they didn't have the electric shears, of course. They had those nice uh, scissory ones, which um, got dull pretty quick. And the sharpening stones were usually nearby. And the housing of the sheep and, and the processing of the wool after it was cut and all of the other products that you get from this one agricultural <clears throat> animal, the milk, the meat, the cheese, and the parchment, too. So again, something that is vitally important to the medieval economy, and it's centered uh, on agriculture and the thousands of people that that had a part to make all of this feasible. And this is, again, just a sort of a guy drinking from a wooden bowl, the clothes he's wearing, the barrel, the brew he's drinking, all of it is from agriculture and forest industries. The chandler, of course, making candles from beeswax, um, the honey from the bees, the the wax, which was used not only for candles, but for many different um, um, waxing fabric to help seal things and, and um, used um, on, on leather armor and other leather things and, and cordage. And I think that's a picture of Viking animal sinew rope, I believe. And the very books that the medieval manuscripts were written on, of course, was was um, agricultural product. And the armor, the leather armor that the armies wore, more agricultural products. And everything that tied everything to everything else, you know, the horses, reins, the stirrups, the saddle, everything um, depended on agriculture. The baskets, every type of weaving, <clears throat> um, baskets for carrying, harvesting, storing, uh, all of it, agriculture. And um, of course, those pretty boys over there with their pointy shoes, those shoes and all the everything they're wearing, agriculture. So I'm interested in food. Who's not? <laughs> this is the part of the medieval agriculture that I enjoy um, talking about and doing and preserving and all that good growing things, of course, um, food without which life has no meaning. All right. These are just a few of the medieval crops that I've grown. And by medieval, I I mean heirloom. We can get close to what was grown in the Middle Ages um, thanks to, believe it or not, some of the monasteries <clears throat> and some of the remote areas that have been planting and growing the same thing for generations upon generations. Uh, some of it we can get close to that we know there's some normal genetic drift. <clears throat> and then there is some hybridization where we've lost the original strain. But most of it, you can get pretty darn close to what was grown. And the really intense hybridization didn't really start happening until um, till the colonial period. So the majority of the feudal lands were field crops and they had uh, the three field system. You know, you plant and grow on two fields and let one go fallow and, and let the animals graze there and, and fertilize it. And then, you know, you rotate. The, the primary field crops were oats, peas, wheat, barley, and rye. And of course, most of that went into bread. Uh, of course, the basis of ale and beer um, supplied thatching, 
for housing people in both animals, fodder, fodder to feed livestock. <clears throat> and the, the kitchen garden and the monastic gardens grew herbs, vegetables, and the manor house, of course, had a kitchen garden as well, which is a lot of your non-field crops came from. And uh, fruits were often harvested wild if they were not, if you did not have an orchard of some type in um, the manor house or the monastic garden. So let's take a look at these vegetables we have here. The red carrots on the upper left. Carrots used to be all kinds of different colors and they really weren't uniformly orange until like the 1600s. And that was due to some marketing and some bargaining for someone who owned some orange carrots and thought his carrots were the best and everybody had to buy them and grow them. But you can still find a lot of those uh, seed sources and the varieties of, of different color carrots. Um, I grew, I don't off the top of my head remember which varieties, but I do have it written down amazingly enough. Um, you can see those red carrots on the upper right. One was a black carrot. It might even be, no, no, it wasn't. Um, you can see the smaller of the two um, is a black carrot. I think that's what it's called, black carrot. And the other one was called something else and I don't really remember. But they have a delicious and subtly different taste. And I think we lost a lot of different flavors when we started to hybridize. So the modern versus the medieval varieties. Um, there's some, oh, the beets, next one over from the red carrots and the round Spanish black radish. And they do they do say round because there are other types of Spanish black radish. These are the round Spanish black radish and they're delicious. They're easy to grow. Absolutely medieval period. There's some growing out in my garden now and they haven't been touched by the frost yet. And I need to get out there and harvest them before they are. And of course, cabbage. Cabbage um, wasn't quite as pretty as it is now or pretty in a different way. And that's uh, the broccoli rabi on the lower left and cauliflower on the lower right. These are all things that I've grown. The cauliflower was interesting. Oh, and that's a leek right behind it, the cauliflower. Um, a really loose head of the cauliflower. And of course, very different than what you see today. So here are some different kind of lost or things that are not grown, not readily grown everywhere. The upper left is a red kohlrabi, perfectly medieval. If you like kohlrabi, I highly recommend the white Vienna kohlrabi, not the red kohlrabi. It was kind of bitter and woody, but, you know, live and learn. The red is supposed to be closer to medieval variety. The second picture over is skirret. And this was grown all over Europe, uh, way back to Roman times. It was a, a staple starchy food right up until the potato came to Europe. And then they were like, heck with this stuff, the potato is a lot easier to grow and has a higher nutrition content. And a skirt fell by the wayside. It, it thankfully, again, was still grown in some out of the way places that we were able to preserve the species. And it grew wild like mad. So I don't think it would have disappeared anyway. Uh, in like a cooler climate, it was all over Germany in some of the cooler climes of Germany. Um, the other one is a cardoon or a thistle artichoke, another another vegetable that, you know, we don't see too often. That one, I've had a hard time growing here. I think it likes more of a maritime environment. It grows great in the Pacific Northwest. Long Island up there um, grows pretty good. And the other one is a Romanesco broccoli. I thought at first it was it was a cauliflower, a funky cauliflower, but no, that is actually a, a broccoli. And from what I understand, all of those broccolis, cabbage, um, you know, the the um, kohlrabi, all of that was originally grown from mustard seeds, related, not seeds, mustard plants. So it was all uh, selected. Certain things were selected from the mustard plant, whether it was leaves, flowers, you know. Um, where was I? Oh, so here we are. 
and um, oh, salsify on the left, the oyster root, you sometimes hear it called. And I've grown some of that. It doesn't, to me, it doesn't taste anything like oysters, but it's pretty good in, in like the stew. It, and it kind of thickens up a, a little bit. Uh, so it, it's kind of okay. I wasn't really impressed. So the reason why things change, why do the vegetables look so different then compared to now? Well, now we breed for all, everything in that list there. We breed for aesthetics, uniformity, shelf life, the extended harvest size, you know, those big mammoth giant strawberries that you get that have absolutely no flavor and um, increased nutritional content, growing speed, all of those things. So it's a very different uh, reasons why um, certain varieties are grown now compared to the Middle Ages. So one thing I would like to tell you about, I'm not going to talk too much about, about um, food preservation this one, I, I know it was in the description, but I do have a presentation on that. And if you're interested, I can um, offer it at another university or I can send you the notes. But one project that I did that I want to tell you about, well, actually, uh, let's stop here. Is there any like pressing questions or anything like that? Do we want to take a question break? I had one question. Okay, go ahead. Somewhere in an article, Salsify was, they were going for weird descriptions and they said it tastes like an oyster and it bleeds when you cut it. <laughs> Figured you answered the first one. So does it actually bleed when you cut it? <laughs> or something oh. similar? <laughs> well, the plant, the, the sap bleeds a little bit when you cut the plant, but not when you cut the root. Yeah, no, not that I know okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe they had a particularly juicy one. I don't know. Or maybe I went. Like I said. Attention. Yeah. <laughs> well, they were also going for the weird descriptions because there were a couple yep. of plants, but that was the one I was like, oh, it bleeds. I have to grow this. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I missed that. Thank you. But, it, you know, it's, it's lovely to grow. It's absolutely beautiful foliage. And I don't think I have a picture of it here. And a, and a stunning flower, this spiky pink flower. And it will seed itself all over your garden and I don't care because it's beautiful I let them come up for the most part wherever they they land and and um that's been fun they're, they're really beautiful that so, sounds like a lovely set of reasons to grow it in and of itself absolutely so one of the reasons I was excited about doing this presentation was to introduce people to medieval agriculture who maybe have an interest in it, maybe, you know, want to do more with it, or have no idea what it's all about. But it's such a broad topic and covers so many different disciplines that you can, you know, flip through this presentation and find one little iota of information that really resonates with you. And you can run with it. And that can you incorporate it into your S. CA persona, do arts and sciences with it, you know, whatever you want to do, because it's so, it's so broad. And I want to encourage people to kind of get out of the, or not get out of, but expand from the staple of SCA arts and sciences, because there's so much more out there that we could be doing and exploring and showing and sharing. And, and that, of course, it's the really fun part. And so therefore we get to this, I really wanna share my experience in growing a feast one year for Sacred Stone, it may have been a baronial birthday. And I'll walk you through quickly, walk you through the process of how we got from, you know, the dirt over to the good stuff. Come on. There we go. So the first thing, and, and you know, if anybody is interested in do this and doing something like this, I wholeheartedly suggest it, but I suggest working with other people who grow bits and pieces 
because this project that I took on was really overwhelming. It was just almost too much. Pulled it off, but it was a stressor. So group projects, yay. Um, I worked with the, the head feast chef to select a menu and, and talk about a budget with them. Um, I did not, I probably bought $15 worth of seeds at the time and used stuff that I had. And I think I just paid for that myself. But um, what I did have to do is, is to research the research and select the seed varieties that matched up with what the chef wanted to cook and what was going to do well here in my area of North Carolina and would be ready and har harvestable by the time the feast was ready to roll. So that was really uh, a, a timing um, headache, big headache. But um, and of course, you know, starting the seeds started much of them indoors. And then, you know, meanwhile, outside is prepping the planting area. And again, planting at the right time. And if your stuff is going to be ready before that, uh, make sure you have a plan to store it or um, preserve it somehow. So on this particular menu, uh, cucumbers, cucumber pickles, sweet pickles and fermented pickles, and that's lacto um, fermentation pickles. And then the root salad was the heirloom carrots and uh, mixed in with citrus and ginger, and that was really delicious. And um, the eggs came from my chickens. I think I had 40 chickens at the time, um, which is a lot. I don't normally keep that many, but um, I think it was 100 eggs. And it was pretty cool because they were just all different colors. And this was like the precursor to the deviled eggs, uh, which were kind of neat. Goop out the yellow and, and, you know, do the regular deviled egg thing, but then they kind of fry it face down um, and then serve it. The second remove were uh, greens. Um, and that was basically salad, different salad stuff. Yeah, sauteed with onion and garlic. Both, grew both the onion and the garlic and the greens. <clears throat> I think it, I had um had mustard greens and Swiss chard. Oh, I think I have a list later of what what I grew. So the chicken were raised locally, and the the beans I uh, grew lima beans, which was an experience. Um, that was a first time for me. I guess fava beans would have been more appropriate in period, but the fava, a lot of people are allergic to the fava beans. So lima beans it is. And we made a lima bean mash out of that, which was really good, like refried beans, but with lima beans. Uh, the third remove was um, scallops from local scallops, on the coast local scallops. Couscous mixed with a lot of the herbs that I grew. The cabbage was the red cabbage. And um, bread, I think we had, you know, honey butter and herb butter um, with the herbs and, and my the honey for my hives. And, um, oh, the cheese, Mistress Honora, or she did a great job with the cheese, making everything from local, locally sourced milk. And the blackberries with fruit compote, and that was made with uh, blackberries and honey. It was a really delicious feast. And for some reason, to me, and a, a lot of the people who were involved in the project, it was extra special because everything was local and everything, you know, as much as possible was grown um, specifically for the feast. So this is what I grew. There's some of those different colored carrots in the lower left there. The blackberries were established or are established. So they've been on the property for a few years. The red cabbage, the parsley, and the closest to the medieval varieties are the flat Italian style uh, parsley. 
sweet marjoram, tarragon, English thyme, the lima beans, garlic, onions, cucumber for the pickles, the dills for the pickles, the grape leaves for the pickles, <laughs> uh, Swiss chard, collard greens, dandelion leaves. The dandelion leaves were, were fun. They don't look like quite like the dandelions in your lawn, the ones I, I seeded specifically for the feast. Um, and the ones in the lawn are the only ones I was familiar with until then. So um, savory carrots. Uh, parsnips and beets. Yeah, I think I don't remember what we did. I think the beets went in the root salad, maybe, and the eggs and the honey. So a variety of different things. And let me tell you, it stressed me out. And I understand a little bit more of the medieval mindset when I think about, oh my God, what happens if my crop fails? We're all gonna starve. Well, in addition to all that worry, of course, you had the monotonous part, is the tending the plants, the weeding, thinning, staking, watering, all that good stuff that you have to do, and the harvesting, the cleaning, and the storage, because we did have some of this come in before the feast, but it was timed that way, so it worked out. The, um, of course, the cabbage store really well. It, so that was no problem storing them um, when they were ready. The lima beans I did have to can because they were ready um, before um, before the feast was. And the garlic, you know, garlic and onions, pull them when they're ready. And you cure them. The, you cr cure them by just letting the outer layers dry for a few days and then putting them um, out of the sun inside in a, in a cool place. So... They were no problem. Um, the blackberries were done in the spring. I turned them into jam so we could use the jam for the fall feast. And um, the greens, most of the greens, and we used and the, the herbs and the carrots. Those were all, I think we we cut the cabbage beforehand, but the carrots, the herbs, the greens were, were all used fresh. And the honey um, came off in um, August. I want to say this was either a late August or early September feast, but um, the honey came off the hives in August, so that was that was around, and the, and the eggs were fresh. So of course, then the uh, magic begins, and uh, taking all that good stuff that I grew and uh, getting getting it to the people that turn it into a sumptuous feast, and you know, hoping you. You grew enough, <laughs> I did, and uh, and there were leftovers, and um, nothing nothing died. I didn't have any failures, and and you know, yay, that was time is okay, seven thirty three. Um, nothing horrible happened, so that was good. So yeah, from from seedlings to supper, that's the uh, picture of the the red cabbage starting out, and of course the red cabbage salad citrus and ginger and it was absolutely delicious so that was um thrilling and here are my helpers my dog who chases the hawks away from from when the chickens are out my hubby with his superior blackberry picking skills and my honey from the sacred stone hives there so and now we kind of come the part of the presentation where I would like you all to jump in <clears throat> a little bit um, because I really want to encourage you all to show off what you do. I know I'm not the only one out there who's growing stuff, but I don't know a ton of people who are, but I, I want you guys to sh show off what you're doing and talk about what you're doing. And get other people excited and enthusiastic. And we have events like Gardens of Time and Oakwood. We have the animal, uh, agricultural animal and animal husbandry guild, the Royal Forestry Guild. Um, if you can't participate hands on directly, sponsor some competitions. You don't have to be a peer to sponsor a competition. Anybody can sponsor. You want to see something cool? You want to see someone, somebody else's cool stuff? Sponsor a competition. Um, enter competitions and 
plan joint project projects. If you're growing things and, and or growing for a feast like I did, like I said earlier, it's labor intensive. And, and I would suggest um, just doing bits and pieces and do sponsor, uh, jointly sponsor competitions as well. So um, you can find information about the guild there that I mentioned. Um, you can find it on Facebook. It's probably the easiest way. Just just look up agricultural agricultural ANS in Atlantia. That's the Facebook group we use, and then the Royal Forestry Guild. Easy to find, great bunch of folks. And I'm gonna stop there because I really want you guys to chime in. I would absolutely love to talk about your ideas that you have, what you'd like to see more of, and how, if you're interested, how we can all collaborate on a project. We talked last year about different people growing parts of a feast, and we were kind of all ready to get that going, but our, our um, the person who was going to do the cooking, that the chef was, had some life issues, and, <clears throat> excuse me, so she had to back out, but it doesn't mean it can't happen, um, but it would take a little bit of planning, but it would be kind of.